Award-winning journalist David Brancaccio has a long history with public media journalism. After working on Marketplace on public radio, he joined Now on PBS in 2003, where he's been host and reporter since Bill Moyers left the show. We caught up with Brancaccio when he visited Madison a few weeks ago for the Society of Environmental Journalism Conference. He talked with us and gave his, his impressions on today's journalism, why public media journalism matters, and the importance of the upcoming Copenhagen Summit on Climate. <laughs> You're here in Madison for the uh, Society of Environmental Journalists Conference. I know that you have a background in environmental journalism. Um, what are some of the trends that you've seen in, in covering the environment over the last few years? It's an incredibly rich beat in terms of opportunity to cover fascinating stories. That kind of rich. What it's not rich is in the resources to actually pay for this kind of journalism. It's one of the issues that the reporters here at the conference in Madison are just wrestling with, which is there are pressing mortal needs here for making sure the public understands what's on the table, what's at stake. And it's a tough time to actually find money to do those stories. And some of the stories do involve travel. On our show now, um, this spring, I was able to go on this amazing journey. And so what we did was through <laughs> magic of television, we took our viewers on that journey with me. World-renowned mountain climber. Conrad Anker, he's a guy who's been up Everest twice. He's actually the guy who found George Mallory's body frozen up on top of Everest, the guy who tried to climb Everest in 1924. He's an amazing mountaineer, alpinist. And uh, he had been in the Himalayas five years earlier and talked about this amazing glacier, which happens to be the source of the Ganges River, this, the, the uh, sacred Ganges River. So we climbed up to 14,500 feet to check this glacier out, which is melting away, climate scientists say, in part because of global warming. And it was a, it's a fascinating story because, you know, why? Was it just travelogue or me trying to climb up to 14.5, see if I could do it? No. We connected the story to water and then downstream to food security, which then becomes national security, because if people don't get the food they need, they get very testy. And then you have becomes a national security issue. And then we connected the story in India to what's going on in the American West to sort of provoke people to reflect on what's at stake when it comes to global warming. So there's plenty of incredibly important stories to do. And it's a great honor to be able to be able to cover them. But you know, the world is meeting in Copenhagen later this year to talk about what's going to happen. And many experts argue that it's now or never on some of this stuff. So journalism plays a role in at least giving citizens the tools they need to evaluate what they see coming out of the summit. And given a weekly show like now that allows you a longer format of television, what goes into the decision-making process of what those, which stories are going to get, get fit into that half hour? Well, it's interesting. We don't want to get to the end of a year and then reflect back on our body of work and go, we didn't do any environmental stories. That could happen. Why? It's not that we're not sensitive to environmental issues. It's because we're a news show, and the pressing news of the day or the week can sort of take over your decision making. And you all oh, got to do that because that's what's in the headlines. So we make sure that doesn't happen. We dedicate a certain number of stories per year to, um, to cover uh, green issues. And it's been quite amazing. I mean, we had a crew in the Pacific an island chain called Kiribati, where it's not about what well, global warming might do sometime when your granddaughter is 50 years old. You can see it right now. Some of the islands there already look like moonscapes because of rising sea levels. Um, so we get to cover these things. And, and we've got an interesting uh, interview coming up with the president of a place called the Maldives. Now, I sat down, that, well, I did my prep before I. I sat down with the president of a country, and it is then when I learned where the Maldives were. I thought they were also in the Pacific. Uh, they're in the Indian Ocean. If you were to walk south to the tip of India and then swim quite a while, you'd get to this island chain. And he's, this president, is engaging in an exercise planning for what if he has to move the entire population of his country somewhere else because he's going to be underwater. I mean, that's really shocking. He uses a very intense word, and I don't use this word lightly because I'm just back from a different story, a, a healthcare story in Rwanda. But the word is genocide. He says, it, you know, if the world thinks that they don't need to engage the global warming issue, because, like, who cares? 
and it could end his country as he knows it, he says, you know, we're talking at genocide. It's very interesting. And these are the sort of important stories that, that um, fit within long-form journalism. And as we all hear right now, the media is going through a huge shift, whether it's the commercial media or public media, um, advertising dollars, eyes on television, newspapers, et cetera. To ask, at risk of asking too big of a question, where do you see media's future going right now? I'm an early adopter to technology. I love the web. My program really is a multimedia program. It's not just a broadcast television program. However, if you want to make a deep argument and you want to um, layer information, not, if you want to create a journalism that is not superficial in the video realm, right now web really isn't the place. Uh, if you want someone to sit down and meditate on important things for, let's say, an hour or an hour and a half, that's still documentary film or, broadcast or, or television, one form or another. Now, unfortunately, the commercial broadcasters with their TV stations generally are not doing a lot of this coverage, and so then it falls onto public media. Um, what is public media? You know, it, th that actually is a definition that's up for grabs. It could just mean the wonderful work that you do here in Wisconsin. Public broadcasters, and then they have other media, they have online, so you call it public media. But it's also any media that's done in the public interest as opposed to in the interest of corporate profit. And that's actually a pretty big camp of people doing all sorts of things. It's public radio and TV stations, online, but it's also some non-profit online sites. Um, the problem, of course, is, is there a business model for this kind of journalism? Who is really paying for it? There's a flourishing of bloggers. I love bloggers. Bloggers have a lot to give. But it's free, uh, at once you pay for your internet connection, and if your time isn't worth anything, to write a column. It costs money to go off and report a story. Real journalism. Real journalism is witness to history. Real journalism is plowing through primary source documents. Real journalism might be uh, interviewing people who have expertise in a certain area. That kind of stuff requires an investment. And we're still floundering around right now trying to figure out where this is going to come from. I mean, we had millions of people watching our special on climate change that was both in the Himalayas and in the American West. It was very successful in terms of people seeing it. We had a heck of a time finding anybody to pay for it. In the end, we really didn't. So do you have any answers? Well, I mean, some of it is this. Or at least any, uh, any hopes. I always have plenty of hope because I don't think our democracy can survive without a robust media doing serious stories. And our democracy has to survive, so we have to find a way forward. Um, I've been toying with ways of, I think the public is forgetting what journalism is. Okay, what is it really? And how it's different from just commentary. Um, and so maybe there's a way to label real journalism in a way that at least people will recognize it. Um, I don't know, some good housekeeping. I don't know, some good housekeeping seal of approval? I mean, is that possible? I sure don't want the government to do that, but maybe there's some way of doing that. Maybe it's simply something like, if you invest money into your journalism, that that should somehow show up as a flag on your piece, that someone took the time to invest money into some real reporting, man or woman hours, or travel, or, or something. An example is this. It's important to get as many opinions as possible on one of the great human rights story of our time, which is what to do with the detainees in Guantanamo. Right? I think it's important to see how bloggers, how they put it all together, what their synthesis is. However, our public television system sent me to Guantanamo. I've actually been with a professional camera crew. And it didn't cost a fortune, but we needed the clout of being a legitimate medium-sized news organization to get permission from the military to go. We needed the skills to do a good job. We needed a really good sound man and cameraman to get it all down. And then I come back with what we find, and then the blogosphere can engage this. Um, so it's crucial for people to understand that going to Guantanamo is different from having an opinion on Guantanamo. And, and, and if we make those distinctions a little bit more clear, I think that'll help the public understand what the difference is. And maybe then, possibly, money will follow from that. But you know, it's not true that nobody's making money on the internet. Let's just say, for instance, for starters, Google's making a lot of money on the internet. 
Now, the, Google, it's my understanding, is run by some quite public-spirited people in addition to people who like their profit as well. And it may be that going forward, there is a way that some of this can trickle down to the real journalism that's necessary. And uh, I'm going to imagine I know the answer to this question, but public broadcasting can be a key to this, key to this future um, as, as corporations have taken over newspapers and other media outlets. What role can public broadcasting play in the midst of that while these other, other outlets are sort of floundering around for their answer? Because the questions we're looking for aren't quite the same as the questions that they're looking for answers to. So much of the commercial media is about treating the listener or the viewer or the reader as a potential consumer to deliver advertising as an advertising administration device. Public television, public radio, public media try to treat the listener, viewer, the reader as an engaged member of society. And that's a profound difference. We want, if you spend two minutes with us, if you spend three hours with us, we want people to emerge slightly better, knowing something that they didn't know before, a new perspective on an issue. They may not agree with the new perspective, but at least they have something that is adding to their body of knowledge. We want people to grow each time they spend time with public media. Now, that is not what our commercial brothers and sisters have in mind. I mean, I've seen, I've had experience in commercial newsrooms. And I once, it was a profound experience for me. It was a commercial TV newsroom in San Francisco. The news director took the troops together and said, what is the mission of this commercial television newsroom? And some poor sad sack cameraman raised his hand and said, well, in return for getting a license from the government, we need to give back by covering important issues. And the news director hit the ceiling and said, what are you, some kind of an idiot, he said. He said, our mission is to increase the stock price of our parent company. As she said this out loud to the troops, that is our only mission, he said. And it's a great honor to work for an organization that is actually trying to make the viewer uh, a better person, to, to give back, for it to be a, a transformative experience spending some time with us, as opposed to uh, an experience that just urges you to go off and buy a little something, which may be important to our economy, but needn't be the uh, be all and end all of anybody's participation in a democracy.